Christopher Nolan is one of the rare modern filmmakers with instantly recognizable styles. But who is the man behind the time-bending plots, dazzling effects, and posh British accent? Nolan the man is actually way more relatable than you'd suspect. Christopher Nolan might seem exceedingly British to the casual observer. In fact, he was born in London and speaks with a British accent. But he's only half British. While his father, Brendan, hailed from the UK, his mother, Christina, was American. Because of this, Nolan and his two brothers, Matthew and Jonathan, have dual citizenship in the United Kingdom and the US. When they were growing up, the family split their time between London and Chicago. But when Nolan began trying to make movies, he couldn't break into the British film industry. In an interview with The Guardian about those early days, Nolan said, In England, there's a great suspicion of the new. In cultural terms, that can be a good thing. But when you're trying to break into the film industry, it's definitely a bad thing. He felt Hollywood was more open to fresh talent and ideas. So he and his family settled in the Hollywood Hills. But Nolan hasn't abandoned his British point of view. His 2017 film Dunkirk, about the critical World War II battle, was told from the perspective of the Brits stranded on French shores. There are 400,000 men on this beach. And it just so happens to be the highest grossing World War II movie of all time. George Lucas's game-changing blockbuster Star Wars Episode IV A New Hope became an important touchstone to millions of fans upon its release on May 25, 1977. One of them was seven-year-old Christopher Nolan. In an interview at the 2015 Tribeca Film Festival, Nolan shared how Star Wars inspired him to be a filmmaker, saying, I would make these imaginatively titled little science fiction films with a Super 8 camera, called Space Wars, and recently transferred them to DVD to watch them with my children, and I was surprised to realize how bad they are. The 2018 book Christopher Nolan, A Critical Study of the Films, explains how Nolan and his younger brother Jonathan would use action figures as stop-motion characters and build sets out of household items like flour, egg cartons, and toilet paper rolls. But when asked if he'd been interested in directing The Force Awakens, Nolan told The Daily Beast, As far as whether or not I would have ever done it, the truth is I think I'll be afraid to touch it. Christopher Nolan is best known for the way he manipulates time and perspective in his projects. His signature storytelling style, non-linear and often told through the lens of unreliable narrators, dates back to his earliest work. Nolan's short films Doodlebug and Tarantula play with memory and point of view in much the same way that later features like Insomnia, Inception, and Tenet do in order to build suspense and create mystery. Nolan's made such narrative tricks his calling card, but those techniques have long been used in detective novels to obscure the truth from the reader until it's time for the big reveal. And the director has been a lifelong crime fiction fan. Speaking with the DGA Quarterly in 2012, Nolan revealed, When I was 16, I read a Graham Swift novel, Waterland, that did incredible things with parallel timelines and told a story in different dimensions that was extremely coherent. But though Nolan is a writer, his true medium is the screen, and he learned how to visually manipulate time and perspective from a few seminal late 20th century films, including Blade Runner, The Man Who Fell to Earth, and Pulp Fiction. When the time came to choose a college major, Christopher Nolan didn't go to film school. Instead, on his father's advice, he decided to study English literature at University College London. But that doesn't mean he stopped loving or making movies. Nolan chose UCL specifically because it had a film studio complete with a Steenbeck editing suite and 16mm cameras. There was also a screening room. And as president of the UCL Film Society, Nolan got to program showings of some of his favorite films and use the admission charges to fund his work. UCL ended up being the right choice for Nolan for personal and professional reasons. He met his longtime wife and producing partner Emma Thomas on his first day at university. She continues to produce his movies to this day, and is involved in every step of the process as his closest creative confidant. The couple share four children, Flora, Oliver, Magnus, and Rory. Though he's one of the most artistically and financially successful directors working today, Nolan endured a streak of bad luck during the mid to late 90s, when he was living in London and looking for a way into the industry. Around the time his first attempt at a feature-length film Larry Mahoney fizzled, Nolan's apartment was burglarized. In an interview at New York's IFC Center, Nolan reflected, I realized that the door was just plywood and that was never keeping anybody out. What was keeping people out was the social protocols that we have that allow us to live together. I was interested in the certain types of people who would stop observing those protocols and why that would be. A criminal is not complicated. What you really fear is inside yourself. He took what could have been a traumatic experience and turned it into the catalyst for a storied career. With his wife Emma Thomas producing and his friend Jeremy Theobald in the lead role, Nolan got to work writing, directing, filming, and editing his debut feature, Following. 
the neo-noir film imagines what would happen if a down-and-out writer began stalking strangers for inspiration. It was made with practically no money. Estimates put the budget at about £3,000. Out of necessity, Nolan utilized a non-linear storytelling structure, black-and-white film stock, natural light sources, found locations, and single takes. It paid off. Following earned attention on the festival circuit and invited comparisons to Alfred Hitchcock. Though Christopher Nolan regularly commands budgets of eight or nine figures, he insists that his biggest step up as a director came between the productions of Following and Memento. He made the former on his own dime while working a full-time job, but with Memento, he had financing and was for the first time a paid director. I can't make new memories. Everything just fades. He told DGA Quarterly, The difference between shooting following with a group of friends wearing our own clothes and my mum making sandwiches to spending $4 million of somebody else's money on Memento and having a crew of 100 people is, to this day, by far the biggest leap I've ever made. But Memento proved to be a difficult sell. Even after production was complete and everyone agreed the film itself was fantastic, studio executives heaped high praise on the concept, performances, and overall quality of the finished product. But they thought the movie was too difficult to market and too confusing for average audiences. With no distribution deal forthcoming, Nolan's backers at New Market Films decided to release it themselves. The support of fans like Steven Soderbergh and great word of mouth turned Memento into an instant cult classic. It went on to make nearly $40 million. After Memento became the talk of the town, Christopher Nolan and Emma Thomas established their own production company, Syncope Films, and began a nearly two-decade relationship with Warner Brothers. The Batman franchise had been languishing in development limbo since 1997's poorly received Batman and Robin until Nolan went to Warner Brothers to pitch his concept of the character. His vision was dramatic and realistic, not campy and comic booky. His Batman was deeply human. Warner Brothers gave him a deal then and there. We weren't really making a Batman movie. We were making a Chris Nolan movie. 2005's Batman Begins was a triumph for both Nolan and the studio. But it was nothing compared to the sequel that came three years later. The Dark Knight was a cultural phenomenon. Critics and audiences loved it. By the winter of 2008, The Dark Knight was squarely in the middle of the awards conversation. When the nominees for the 2009 Academy Awards were announced, the late Heath Ledger was recognized for his portrayal of the Joker, and the film received eight nods in total, but none for Best Picture or Best Director. These snubs are still seen as one of the Academy's worst oversights, attributed to bias against the genre. Following the backlash, the Oscars expanded the Best Picture category from five to ten nominees as of 2010. Christopher Nolan's Dark Knight trilogy stands on its own as a cinematic achievement, but it's also part of the larger DC film franchise. But the DC movies have never been able to pull off the same blend of prestige and popularity that Nolan's trilogy or the best entries of the Marvel Cinematic Universe can claim. Fans might be surprised to learn Nolan has been involved with DC Studios beyond his three Batman entries. He also produced Zack Snyder's Man of Steel, Batman vs Superman Dawn of Justice, and Justice League. Nolan and Snyder are good friends, and he was originally brought on to consult on Man of Steel. When Batman was introduced into Snyder's films, Nolan was happy to advise, but he didn't feel any ownership of the character. New rules. We're criminals, Alfred. If there's any doubt of the pair's true friendship, it was Nolan who protected Snyder from having to screen the Joss Whedon cut of Justice League after Snyder left the project due to the tragic death of his daughter. When the pandemic upended the film industry, each studio had its own way of coping. Some delayed films for a year or more, while others released their movies via streaming or premium video on demand. Warner Brothers eventually opted for a day-and-date strategy in which films become available in theaters and on streaming at the same time. In late summer 2020, one of Warner's films, Nolan's much-anticipated Tenet, had the misfortune of being the first major motion picture to debut in theaters after COVID restrictions began to lift, but before Warner Media's day-at-date strategy was in place. That test you passed? Not everybody does. Tenet's underwhelming box office performance made sense given that cinemas in many major markets, including New York and China, weren't open yet. But it was Nolan going to bat for filmmakers like James Gunn and Denis Villeneuve that severed his relationship with Warner Media. 
Nolan publicly called out the studio after they blindsided creatives with the decision to release their 2021 slate of titles on HBO Max on or shortly after their theatrical premieres. In a statement to The Hollywood Reporter, Nolan said, Some of our industry's biggest filmmakers and most important movie stars went to bed the night before thinking they were working for the greatest movie studio and woke up to find out they were working for the worst streaming service. These guys have given a lot for these, these projects and uh, they deserved to be uh, consulted and, and spoken to about what was going to happen to their work. Shortly afterward, Nolan announced that he'd be making his next film, Oppenheimer, with Universal. He demanded a 100-plus day theatrical window out of principle. Because Christopher Nolan has made some of the most visually spectacular films of the last 20 years, audiences might assume he's all in on the latest cutting-edge technology. But both in his personal and professional life, Nolan prefers to keep things analog. Chris is really great in that he wants it for real. He wants it in camera. He doesn't want to do CG. Though he films his projects specifically for IMAX screens, he aims to capture as much as he can using practical effects. Not only because it looks more authentic, but because sometimes it's actually cheaper. Nolan infamously blew up a real Boeing 747 in Tenet for this reason, and he recreated something approximating a nuclear bomb for Oppenheimer for the sake of authenticity. In his everyday life, Nolan is even less reliant on modern technology. He has neither a mobile phone nor an email address and intends to keep it that way. Nolan explained to The Hollywood Reporter that cell phones weren't as ubiquitous when he started making movies in the 90s. By the time smartphones came around, he'd made a name for himself and could easily be reached since everyone within his orbit had one and could simply tap him on the shoulder to get his attention. As he says, I actually really like not having one because it gives me time to think.